Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Max Chalmers, an economist at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. TOPS is organized by Mike Pesco at University of Missouri, C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at John Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pesco from University of Missouri to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our summer fall 2023 season with a single paper presentation by Ted Wigner from the Ohio State University entitled E-Cigarette versus Combination Nicotine Replacement Therapy delivered through state quit lines on smoking abstinence following a recent failed quit attempt, a randomized trial. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Dr. Wagner is a professor in the Leonard J. M. P. Jr. and Charlotte L. M. P. Chair in Cancer Research in the Department of Internal Medicine at Ohio State University and the founding director of the Center for Tobacco Products and co-leader of the Cancer Control Program at the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. His research program focuses on addiction and tobacco regulatory science with a specialized focus on evaluating the behavioral uh, pharmacological and toxic toxicological effects of cigarette and non-cigarette tobacco products. His work has been extramurally funded, NIH, FDA, AHA since 2012, serving as the principal investigator or co-investigator on more than 30 grants. Dr. Wigner has served as the primary mentor or sponsor on six NIH training awards, as well as co-mentor on numerous others. Katrina Vickerman, director of the Center for Wellbeing Research at RVO Health, which is a vendor for 21 state tobacco quit lines in the U.S., is a co-author of the study and will answer select questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is John Oliver, an economist at the Department of Health and Human Services in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. Dr. Ted Wagner, thank you for presenting for us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Let me share my screen here. All right, hopefully everybody's able to see that. Um, so again, thank you all uh, for inviting me to to present here today. I'm excited to share the results uh, of this study. Um, so with no further ado, I'm gonna get going. Um, first, I wanna give my funding uh, disclosures. So this grant was funded by uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse um, and the FDA. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, all my um, funding over the last decade and forever uh, has only been from the NIH or FDA. Um, or the American Heart Association. I also want to take uh, the time to to thank all the collaborators on this study. This, uh, this study was a beast of a study, if I could say. Uh, there was a lot that went on during this, um, including COVID and um, changes in product and things like that. So definitely want to thank all my collaborators, um, both at RVO Health and Katrina, who's on today, uh, folks at uh, University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, MUSC, um, and obviously at Ohio State, as well as the uh, NIDA scientific officers. All right, so let's get started. So I think as we all know, quitting smoking is difficult. And in fact, cessation is the least likely outcome. Um, and even with FDA approved uh, smoking cessation products like NRT and medications, uh, even with counseling, while smokers can double their chances of staying quit, most smokers don't quit. Um, and in any given year, about 65% of smokers wanna quit and about half of those try to quit but less than 10% of those are able to stay quit for a year, um, resulting in one in three smokers dying from a smoking-related illness 
in about 500,000 deaths a year and 6 million deaths worldwide. Um, so the ultimate question is, if FDA approved products and counseling don't work for most smokers, what should we do? And this is what I think we uh, appreciate about potentially about e-cigarettes and their potential promise is that one, they're likely to be far less harmful than combustible tobacco cigarettes. And uh, we know that a smoker who completely switches to an e-cigarette is exposed to significantly lower levels of toxicants, similar to actually the toxicant levels that we find in uh, exclusive uh, users of nicotine replacement therapy. And we do see some uh, uh, resulting reduction in short-term adverse health outcomes. Often, e-cigarettes are also more appealing and satisfying than FDA-approved nicotine replacement therapies. So potentially, we could be increasing uh, not only uh, the favorability of it, but also maybe even the reach. So people might uh, look to use e-cigarettes uh, who were uh, unsuccessful with NRT in the past. Also, emerging research, the latest Cochrane review, suggests that uh, e-cigarettes are likely better than NRT at helping people quit smoking. Um, the estimate uh, in that latest Cochrane review was that out of 100 smokers, if you, there's 100 smokers who wanted to quit smoking, 9 to 14 would be successful with an e-cigarette, whereas about 6 would be successful with NRT. And when we do look at the trials that were included in that, some of which I've, I've put here, we see that the results in terms of e-cigarettes efficacy on smoking cessation has tended to get better using uh, e-cigarettes, uh, 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 newer, newer e-cigarettes. So we understand, I believe, that e-cigarettes have evolved over time from these Sigalite products to um, Pensile and then mechanical mods. And those products were largely trying to increase satisfaction via nicotine delivery by increasing power or wattage of the device. We then find uh, with the release of Juul that e-cigarettes start to evolve not only to increase nicotine delivery, but increase satisfaction by manipulating nicotine concentration and form and not focusing on power um, so much. This has led to a variety of uh, positive things and some issues, as we all know, with the youth, uh, with youth vaping. That goes beyond the scope of this talk, but we can just see that the style and type of e-cigarette and uh, uh, the way that in we're getting increases in um, nicotine delivery and satisfaction have changed with these newer e-cigarettes, specifically high concentration nicotine salt-based products. And a study in 2020 by Kim Pulvers and uh, colleagues suggested that these newer e-cigarettes, these high concentration nicotine salt-based products might be very effective at smoking absence. So we see six weeks biochemically uh, verified smoking absence of near 30%. At six months, it wasn't biochemically verified, but they see 24% uh, smoking absence. Again, not biochemically verified. So this was playing uh, you know, in our mindset, trying to understand how as e-cigarettes continue to evolve, we continue to see a product that not only is uh, uh, better than uh, uh, NRT, but even better than uh, earlier versions of the e-cigarette or of e-cigarettes. In addition to that, um, quit lines seem to be a place where the use of e-cigarettes might be very helpful. E-cigarettes are an effective means uh, or pardon me, uh, quit lines are an effective means for treating cigarette dependence. Uh, even in populations that have historically been hard to reach, uh, quit lines do a very great job of increasing the reach uh, uh, to especially lower SES uh, uh, populations um, to provide them smoking cessation uh, services. Uh, and it's important to know that quit line practice is guided by the best available evidence um, and very, very robust evidence. They don't make changes very easily. They need to have strong support for anything they do. So current quitline treatments typically includes counseling and NRT. And today, quitlines have not incorporated the use of e-cigarettes as a quit strategy. And that's for several reasons. One, there's a lack of FDA approval um, for e-cigarettes for cessation. Um, two, few, uh, and especially at the time of this, this study started, uh, RCTs comparing e-cigarettes to NRT. 
and none examining their efficacy uh, when they were delivered via the quit line. And so this is going to lead uh, to the purpose of the current study. But I have now time set up for a brief question session um, in case there were emergent questions that should be answered before we go further. Thank you, Ted. Very interesting so far. Um, audience, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, function, and we will ask those to Ted. Um, but first, I am going to turn it over to our discussant today, John Oliver, to see if he has any questions or comments. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Ted, uh, one question came to mind um, on the previous slide. When we're thinking about, you mentioned that uh, the lack of FDA approval is a reason why these quit lines are not incorporating e-cigarettes. Um, do you know if that's like a legal mechanism at the state level um, that these states or these quit lines at the various states are not implementing it? Or is it just wanting to um, you know, be consistent with best practices? I think it's, uh, you know, it's funny because Katrina would be the best person to answer that question. So I would encourage her to also put something in the chat, but I, let me give it a shot. I think it's both. I think quit lines and states who are usually using state uh, dollars to fund this um, want to make sure that anything they're doing is defensible and based on the best evidence. I also think for, um, for uh, RVO Health, um, uh, who, who manage, manages a number of state quit lines, I think too, there's also a liability issue. Um, you know, if, if we're putting uh, something that's not FDA approved on a quit line uh, and some, there's some serious adverse events, uh, how might we be held liable? Um, that would be my best stab and best guess at that. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I guess related to that, when we're thinking about, um, you know, whatever your results are that you'll explain in a minute, um, if we're thinking about the potential benefit of these quit lines incorporating um, e-cigarettes, you know, do you know if there are other groups that are currently, you know, promoting e-cigarettes as a uh, smoking cessation strategy, or what's the potential benefit maybe if we find you know, massive results from this study. Um, how can we think about that as as you're explaining the the methods? Yeah, I think I think quit lines are are very effective, but they obviously uh, the majority of people who engage in a quit line or any smoking cessation treatment return to smoking. So, it, I think what we should do if if we appreciate that there is a continuum of risk of nicotine tobacco products. The goal should be to move people as far down that continuum of risk as possible, right? Um, and so, um, I don't think we should uh, ever try to quit quitting. And so, something like an e-cigarette, um, I would view as a harm reduction for someone who wasn't successful with an FDA-approved product, um, but they don't want to smoke, and often they don't want to. They just find it incredibly difficult, and so. For some people, this could be an easier means to help them quit or something just different um, to help them quit. Uh, I, I briefly, I, you know, I used to be told, I don't know if this is based on uh, evidence, but I was once told by the director of a quit line that when you add products, when it's just counseling is offered, you mostly get women uh, calling into the quit line. As soon as you start offering products, men, tend to enter the quit line because they don't want counseling. I wonder if a quit line also offered e-cigarettes, how much more that would further increase your reach from people who've like, I've already tried NRT or, you know, before that's not going to work for me. Well, what if you could open it up to now, well, it's e-cigarettes. I haven't tried that, or I have tried that, but I'm interested to see how maybe it would, it would work via a quit line. Um, and then maybe if it, that doesn't work for them, maybe they're more willing to go back to to NRT, you know, they had more practice at trying different quit methods. So, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. That's that's helpful context. Um, those were my initial questions on these first slides. I'll pass to Mike to see if um, if there's anything from the chat that uh, he'd like to address. Yes, and um, uh, if everybody could please enter your questions in the Q and A function rather than the chat, um, uh, that will be helpful. Um, so that everybody can can see the um, uh, can see the questions. So I'm going to start with the Q and A. Um, 
Uh, uh, Ted, are you familiar with information regarding e-cigarettes being significantly higher in some heavy metals than cigarettes? Heavier metals than in cigarettes. I am not aware of that. Um, I'm trying to... I know that there are heavy metals in e-cigarettes. I haven't looked at a paper recently comparing the heavy metals, but it depends also on what type of, uh, often what type of uh, coil you're using and what type of wires and things like that. Um, but you definitely wouldn't want to have he heavy metals, period, <laughs> um, uh, in your in your e-cigarette, but I'm not sure the comparison. Okay. Um, uh, is there a study comparing the efficacy of U.S. quit lines and U.K. stop smoking services who do not support e uh, who do support e-cigarettes? I'm not sure that there's a study that directly compares those head to head. No. Okay. Okay. Um, question: Why don't we just ban all flavored e-cigarettes? Oh. I think that goes beyond that. I have. I would love to answer that kind of like at the end of this, if that would be possible. And it might be. I think when you see some data, someone might question that. Okay, more. I'll try to remember to bring that um uh, uh, back up. Um, um. So I had a a quick question. Um, how um. So I know that the randomized control trials, right? Uh, these are evaluating nicotine replacement therapy delivered with um, physician guidance, right? Um, uh, and how, how should we think about the quit line then? Uh, I mean, are the RCT studies then? Um, I mean, is this basically, I don't think there's a physician on the, the phone necessarily with patients, but I think there's a trained uh, nicotine uh, addiction specialist on the phone, right? right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so should we be thinking about, um, you know, the RCTs is very generalizable to the experience of quit lines, or has anybody ever gotten into the nuanced differences bet between receiving um, guidance in a physician's office versus receiving guidance or like a recommendation to use nicotine replacement therapy in a physician's office versus on the phone? And are there any known um, differences in terms of the effectiveness of even just nicotine replacement therapy, putting aside e-cigarettes for a moment, depending on the method of uh, delivery? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure on those head to head comparisons. I would say, yes, the, you know, on the quit line, it is a trained coach, a tobacco treatment specialist who then receives additional training, you know, on the methods of the quit line. So they tend to be uh, very well trained in, you know, understanding, you know, the role of nicotine and addiction and, um, you know, the use of uh, nicotine replacement therapy products. We for this study, we did have to train them on e-cigarettes, though. Um, you know, so that they understood, you know, uh, some of the nuances in e-cigarettes and using e-cigarettes. Um, the counseling, I think, is robust and probably more robust than you would get in a uh, uh, physician setting, where maybe they're going to do, you know, two A's and an R or something at best if they're really, you know, doing it well. Um, but, uh, this was three counseling sessions, each about 10 minutes. So this is going to be more robust than that. Um, hopefully that answers your question as well as I could. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's some other questions here. I think that might be well suited for a little bit later in the talk. So I'm going to save those Perfect. and let's uh, continue, please. Perfect. All right. So the aims of the study was to examine among recent quit line treatment failure, so people who did not successfully quit smoking using the quit line, we then uh, re-randomized them and examined the impact of quit line counseling plus Juul e-cigarette. So we actually use, we use the Juul product, the 5% um, nicotine versus quit line counseling plus nicotine replacement therapy. That was combo uh, NRT patch plus nicotine lozenge. I'll go in a little more detail about that later. Um, and then our main outcomes we wanted to look at was that smoking behavior, so cigarettes per day, quit attempts, and smoking abstinence biochemically verified, uh, changes in cigarette dependence, withdrawal symptoms, and then safety. Uh, the study design was two-group randomized one-to-one -one controlled trial. Uh, everybody uh, was offered three counseling calls, eight weeks of product at no cost, um, three assessments, so um, at, uh, comprehensive assessments, one at baseline, eight and 12 weeks that were done over the phone. Um, and everybody uh, also completed daily diaries plus ICO, so that's the ICO, 
um, the uh, portable uh, carbon monoxide monitor uh, for individuals. Um, they actually completed that for 12 weeks uh, and everybody was incentivized um, to complete those and the assessments. Participants could make up to about $250, uh, $250 uh, uh, across the study. Uh, outbound recruitment um, was done by the quit lines. So it was the Oklahoma Tobacco Helpline and the South Carolina Tobacco Quit Line. Uh, and our target uh, recruitment goal was 372 participants. Our eligibility criteria was as follows. So obviously participation in the quit lines uh, within the last four to seven months, we wanted to give them enough time to uh, have completed their quit line treatment. Um, and so we were following up with them uh, after that. Uh, greater than 21 years old, uh, smoking five or more cigarettes per day at the time that we talked to them. So um, uh, since they had already completed their quit line treatment and at least minimal interest in switching to an alternative product. Um, so it just had to be greater than zero. Um, uh, and then English speaking and writing. Some of the key uh, exclusion criteria were uh, still currently uh, using NRT to try to make a quit attempt within the last seven days or trying to make any quit attempt, honestly, within the last seven days uh, using uh, uh, um, uh, counseling, medication, or NRT, uh, and current daily use of an e-cigarette over the last month. Um, the rest are relatively standard um, uh, in terms of medical, psychiatric conditions, pregnancy, whatnot. Um, uh, and then we did have an exclusion for people who had severe physical reactions to using patch uh, in the past or a known allergy to PG and VG, uh, as you can imagine, if we're going to give them e-cigarettes potentially. So here was the study flow. Uh, again, there was a screening phase, a baseline phase, a randomized product trial phase where we were actually giving them the products, followed by a surveillance phase for four weeks where they did not receive products, but we still did assessments. And then we did give a little bit of a room uh, uh, four weeks after the uh, final follow-up assessment, uh, just in case we had latecomers uh, uh, to complete that survey before participants could re-enroll in the quit line if in fact they wanted to. Um, so you can see uh, the study flow here. And again, um, the daily diaries um, and ICO assessments uh, went on for, for 12 weeks. But you can see the three coaching calls and product shipments, uh, which were done uh, at two time points. And here were the two groups and what they uh, all received. So the e-cigarette group and the combination NRT group all received a phone, so a Samsung um, phone and paid phone service for 16 weeks. That's so that they could complete uh, uh, ICO measurement and also the daily diaries. Um, they also were sent a CLIN card. That's how we paid them. Uh, it's like a, it's a credit card that you can uh, put uh, funds onto, uh, a pamphlet. And then for the e-cigarette group, they got a Juul uh, device with charger and then eight week supply um, of 5% menthol or 5% um, Virginia tobacco flavored Juul pods. Um, please know that we sent four weeks worth at a time um, and participants were able to select the flavor that they preferred. So either menthol or Virginia tobacco. And then for the NRT group, similarly, an eight week supply of generic nicotine patches and then Nicorette lozenges uh, sent in two shipments. And then here was our, uh, uh, Here's our consort diagram with our randomization uh, and uh, also shows our retention. So we randomized 350, not 372. Uh, so this was 94% of our recruitment. This was, and I can do this more in the question uh, Q&A uh, if we have time, but there were multiple things going on uh, during this time, including, you know, at one point this grant was actually again supposed to use a standardized research e-cigarette. So that's why it has that, it's the U01. And then when that failed to become available and then COVID hit, since our study was remote, we were given the option to potentially use a commercially available product. And so we did, and that's why we switched to Juul. Um, so that required us changing our computer system uh, uh, pieces that were on board uh, at RVO Health, but also getting approval from quit lines uh, to make sure they were okay with it. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of discussions there about switching from a research e-cigarette that NIDA was, you know, kind of backing to uh, uh, Juul, which was 
very prominent in the news at that time. Um, and so that took some time. Um, and then uh, uh, as then when COVID happened and uh, then at one point there was a potential jewel ban that was going on. Um, long story short, we, we couldn't hit our target. We ran out of money and we ran out of time. Um, so uh, we got 350. We were very happy with 350. Um, I gave us 175 in each arm. Um, and as you can see here, over 12 weeks, we had about 72% retention um, in each arm, which is very consistent with other um, quit line studies. Um, and so since I've covered most of the methods, I'll take another uh, time for some brief questions. Sounds great. Thanks, Ted. Um, uh, let's turn it over to John to see if he has any questions or comments. Yeah. Um, so a few questions on the exclusion criteria and just the people who were in your study. Um, yep. One of the exclusions was, I think, daily use of e-cigarettes. And I'm wondering if you have, did you have data on how often folks were using e-cigarettes and you whittled it down to daily? Or did you start off with daily and just ask that? Was it um, was it a function of like trying to just get enough people in the study? Yeah, both. Um, both the last two. Um, <laughs> uh, Katrina um, and others had done studies that had actually, you know, uh, internal data, I think they've been published now, of like what quit line callers looked like. Um, and, you know, there used to be cigarettes. And as you can imagine, you know, when this was funded in 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, um, uh, that wasn't as much. But as time marched on, you know, and we start this study in 2020, um, you, uh, we started having more and more people who were using e-cigarettes. So we had to open that up. We couldn't have it where they never used an e-cigarette or, had, you know, had used before, ever used, but, you know, hadn't used within the last month or three months or six months. We just would not have had the numbers and it wouldn't actually generalize to who actually is calling the quit line. So we did... We didn't want to have a daily user in there, but we do have, we did want to have some tolerance. And my next slide actually will show you uh, the percent of users in each arm that um, were current users, meaning had used at least once in the last month, but were not daily users, obviously, because they weren't involved in the study. Um, but uh, I'll let you know, it was in both arms, it was uh, right around 10%. So. Um, and part of your answer just there kind of segues into another question. Do you know how well the study participants in your study reflect either like the average e-cigarette user or the average person who calls into this quit line or quit lines in general? I don't know if there's data on um, people who quit via quit lines, but. Um... Yeah, I think it reflects well to quit lines. I That's a really great question that I don't have the answer to about other e-cigarette users in general, because I might have to, you know, I would have to look at e-cigarette using adults as well, because this is we're going to find, you know, the average age just because of the quit line, most of these people are in their mid 50s. So it's a, it's an older group, a poorer group, um, uh, lower socioeconomic status. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's likely going to be different in those ways, but in how they use the product or, you um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure compared to just e-cigarette users in general, but from a quit line, it was similar. Okay. Um, and then, you know, given the rise in e-cigarette use during the time when your study was going on, is it possible that some folks who are going to be in the nicotine replacement therapy group started using e-cigarettes after the the program started or did they have maybe passive e-cigarette use beforehand and throughout this time i'm guessing that the folks who start e-cigarette use might be greater than the folks who are going to start nicotine replacement therapy use yeah and so, what might that do to your results yeah no great question um so and i won't be presenting on these that part of the results today but yes they're um we did ask people during the 12 weeks, you know, not to only use, you know, uh, what we provided them. However, you can see, especially at the 12 week follow up, that there were some people in the NRT group who said, you know, why did you stop using NRT? I didn't like it as much as I like this new e-cigarette. <laughs> you know, um, there were, you know, there were things like that. 
But then we also asked questions about the e-cigarette group too. And like, why did you stop using Juul? Um, and, and some of them did jump and try NRT again. Oftentimes it was because a physician recommended it. So there, there were things that would come up, as you can imagine, that I won't be able to get into the weeds here, uh, but, you know, where sometimes these people would then go see their physician during the course of the study, and they're like, oh, you're using an e-cigarette? I want you to stop using that, and I want you to use NRT instead. Like, there would be things like that that would come up. It didn't seem to be systematic, you know, or it didn't, it wasn't enough that I think it swayed the data too much. Um, but, uh, it was definitely, uh, there are anecdotes of that, um, kind of throughout the study. Okay. Um, and I guess a quick final question that we'll maybe preview stuff we'll talk about, uh, in a little bit, but, uh, how did you come up with the type of jewel products or the type of, um, of nicotine replacement therapy products? Yeah, great question. So at the time, you know, e-cigarettes have kind of always been plagued, right. But definitely picture up to like, you know, up to 2020, you know, pre, um, with making sure that we had products that delivered cigarette-like levels of nicotine. So, you know, trying to get, you know, 15 nanograms per mil within, you know, 10 puffs, you know, that that kind of a thing in five minutes. And uh, a lot of e-cigarettes didn't do that unless they were mechanical mods or you had the wattage right and you had to have, uh, you know, uh, higher nicotine concentration. Um uh, so our thought process on that was twofold. One, we wanted to use uh, a newer device and one that was easy to use. I have a, another switching trial that used Pensile and Mechanical Mods that we're also preparing to submit for publication. But Mechanical Mods are really hard to learn. And we had a full training program and everything else. So we wanted something that was easy, that a quick coach could explain to someone, and that someone could get remotely and figure out themselves. So we definitely wanted to go to more of like a pod style device. And then we wanted to make sure it could deliver nicotine. And up until that point, I had done a PK study on Juul and saw it could deliver nicotine among users. I think we've all seen the literature now, you know, that when you get smokers to use Juul uh, out the gate, they tend not to be as good at extracting nicotine. And so, you know, the PK curves might not get up to 15 nanograms per mil might hover more around nine nanograms per mil, but there is a bit of a learning curve with any e-cigarette. So we wanted to make sure that it could deliver cigarette-like levels of nicotine delivery and would be easy to use. And honestly, easy to ship because it's also lightweight <laughs> too, which is which is nice. So, Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I'll pause there and, um, and kick it to Mike to, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, uh, uh, Ted, your, your co-author, uh, Katrina, has been doing a great job answering some of the um, uh, questions ab ab about the carrying out of the, the RCT and the setup. There's a few additional questions like that remaining here, so let's go through those. Um, uh, did the e-cigs have a certain level of nicotine in them? I know you mentioned it, uh, but I can't can't remember yeah, what the nicotine yeah, concentration 50, was. Yeah, 5% nicotine, 59 um, milligrams per mil, but yeah, okay. 5%. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see, um, if you were, uh, let's see, did you try to achieve racial age and SES diversity? Um, we tried to get more of, uh, the, the short answer is no, we were trying to, uh, meet what the quit line typically has, which tends to be, uh, uh, more diverse than honestly we get in other studies. So in this study, you'll see it was about uh, you know seventy percent white um, and in thirty percent non-white. Um, but we were trying to more match the quit line population um, as opposed, and uh, were restricted by the states also that we were in. Um, is there uh, an evidence treatment protocol of using the e-cig to quit smoking? For example, the type of e-cig, the, uh, the type and the level of e-cig use or frequency? Not to my knowledge. Um, however, I have created, our team has created kind of like a counseling guide where we look at successful switchers versus those who haven't been successful and try to look at what they do and have done. And I know there are papers on this as well. You know I mean, to try to see how is it that they puff on it? Um, how often are they using it? 
uh, you know, uh, what sort of guidance have they got in the past that were helpful? Uh, in our earlier studies, we went to actually vape shop uh, uh, owners, managers, staff, and asked what they felt was most helpful to kind of distill some of that down. Okay. Um, just uh, okay. I think that this clears the the Q and A for. Um, design related questions. There's some other questions that again, we'll come to, I think, after we go through the results. So please continue with your okay, presentation. Great. All right, so here's demographics and baseline tobacco use. Uh, so you see the mean age was about 55. So largely middle age uh, is about 60% female. Uh, most were non-Hispanic. Um, and then you see the breakdown by race, uh, about 70% white. Uh, this was a low SES group, so about 80% made less than $35,000 a year, uh, and about half were uh, unemployed, unable to work, or disabled. Um, when we look at cigarettes per day, um, we see that it was about 17 cigarettes per day most people were coming in. So this is following quit line intervention. So uh, you know this group is, is back to probably uh, baseline, their baseline levels of smoking. Uh, cigarette dependence was moderate to high. Um, and then, as I mentioned, with e-cigarette use, um, when we looked at those who were current users, meaning uh, greater than or equal to monthly use, but less than daily use, um, we're looking at, you know, about 12% in the Juul group and about 6% in the NRT group. But most important, you can see across these key variables that there was no differences between groups. So um, at least on these items, I believe we achieved randomization. When we look at changes in cigarettes per day, now this is the whole group and we get into the, the, the main outcomes here. Uh, we see a reduction in cigarettes per day from about 17 in both groups to dropping to about five uh, at eight weeks. So it's important to remember when you're looking at all these things, eight week, up to eight weeks is what, when we supplied them the product. So that is the product trial phase. They're getting free product. Eight to 12 weeks, they are not getting free product. They might have product left over and are still using it, but um, we are not supplying them any more product. Um, so we see a, a significant decline in cigarette smoking um, among both groups, but no significant differences between groups. When we look at cigarette depend dependence, likewise, we see a decline in both groups uh, from moderate to high to more moderate levels of dependence um, uh, in both groups. Uh, over the 12-week period. And then when we look at seven-day point prevalence abstinence, biochemically confirmed with ICO of less than or equal to eight parts per million, which is what we had in the grant, I can tell you that uh, we can go all the way down to six parts per million uh, and the results remain the same. Um, but uh, we do not see a significant difference between groups. Uh, you know, maybe you could see a potential trend here, um, you know, that Juul was outperforming NRT at eight weeks, but again, it's not statistically significant. Um, so 14% in the Juul group versus about 10% in the NRT group. Uh, and then at week 12, again, uh, so this is more over the four weeks of surveillance phase, uh, uh, we go from about 13% to about 10%. However, this is somewhat consistent with what we were finding in the Cochrane review. However, this is only goes out to 12 weeks. And maybe someone might ask, like, are you planning on doing a survey for something later on without biochemical verification or with biochemical verification? We did think about that, but um, it was largely going to be too difficult um, and too expensive. Um, for us to to do that. It's still something I, I consider from time to time, you know, going out a year or two out from everyone and just seeing where they're at. Um, it may be something that we consider, but um, uh, again, here we're finding at least up to 12 weeks, uh, uh, no significant differences between groups on seven-day PPA biochemically confirmed. 
when we do look at abstainers in both groups, we don't see any differences in nicotine withdrawal symptoms either. So uh, pretty mild uh, uh, withdrawal symptoms. And uh, when we look at the Minnesota nicotine withdrawal scale uh, at week eight, week 12, no real differences there, no real differences on the craving um, outcome or item either on the MNWS. Um, so again, very, very similar findings. When we look at intervention adherence, um, likewise, it's very similar. So when we look at counseling calls completed by the NRT arm, uh, we see that a little more than half, nearly 60% completed all three calls. And we see same, a little more than 60% uh, of, of the uh, those on the Juul group uh, completed all three calls. And use of assigned product, uh, we see at eight weeks, it's about 60%, again, for both groups are using their products. And then at 12 weeks, again, it's approaching significance. Uh, we do see that more uh, participants in the Juul arm are continuing to use their products. But again, it didn't achieve that uh, P less than 0.05 level, but, you know, suggestive, um, you know, if we had a larger sample, um, probably. But um, again, kind of pointing to these, you know, um, are equivalent and maybe maybe Juul is a little bit better at times. Um, when we do look at state product evaluation uh, questions, and these are the big ones, there's, there's more that we've looked at as well. Um, we find that uh, participants found both products helpful to stop smoking and satisfying compared to their cigarettes. So not as satisfying, you know, as we can see, um, but but equally satisfying, which honestly was a surprise for me. I um, I thought uh, that people would find participants would find Juul much more satisfying. Um, uh, that was not the case in this study. Um, we did, however, see that um, uh, participants in the Juul arm thought that their Juul uh, taste good compared to their cigarettes uh, more than NRT, um, which was more in line to kind of what I was thinking. Interestingly, when we do dive in, and we did this in both groups, but I wanted to highlight something here for Juul and an earlier question. When we asked people who stopped using their Juul uh, uh, after eight weeks, why did you stop? using your Juul, and 43% of them reported that they wanted more flavor options other than the, the Virginia tobacco and the menthol. Um, so I thought that was an interesting um, uh, finding, an important finding, especially given uh, some of the literature in this area and some of the big questions that uh, I think FDA needs uh, answered, um, especially in light of uh, regulations ongoing, um, not only at the federal level, but at the state level. When we look at adverse events, we see a similar side effect profile for both groups. So this is at eight weeks. So this is again, when we're providing them product. Um, the, oh, sorry, I didn't have my bolds in here. I should have. Uh, so the only ones that were significant were cough. Um, so uh, those in the Juul arm uh, were four times more likely to report cough uh, compared to NRT. Uh, uh, sleeplessness. Uh, or sleepiness was, uh, or pardon me, sleeplessness was also uh, more common in the NRT arm uh, than in the Juul arm, and dizziness was more common in the NRT arm than the Juul arm. And I apologize, I don't have the other odds ratio in there for sleeplessness. That's actually the wrong um, table. I forgot to copy and change that out. Um, but here it is for 12 weeks then as well. Um, and what you can see is, again, cough is still maintaining, it's declining, but still maintaining um, in the Juul arm compared to the NRT arm, and the sleeplessness is still uh, maintaining uh, in the NRT group. Um, we did have uh, three uh, severe adverse events, um, uh, two deaths, both in the NRT arm, not related to the product. Um, uh, and seizure in the Juul arm. Uh, again, it did not appear to be related to the product that occurred sometime uh, uh, longer after the person had used their Juul and they ended up having um, uh, another illness um, and were severely dehydrated. 
Um, so um, safety profile of both seems to, like other studies seem to be uh, very similar. When we do look at non-abstainers, and I wanted to show this as well, we look at, so we get rid of everybody who's been, who abstained. Among non-abstainers, we do see a reduction in cigarettes per day again. So, you know, uh, Juul and uh, NRT were both helpful, even among those who weren't able to quit completely, to at least reduce um, their smoking um, by about half. Um, again, no differences between groups. Likewise, for cigarette dependence, same thing. We see uh, a reduction. You know, it's clinic from a clinically meaningful standpoint. Uh, I wouldn't say it's huge. It's you know we're 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 dropping from you know 19 to about uh, 17 to 16. Um, uh, so not huge, but in the right direction. And again, no differences between groups. And then when we look at quit attempts, which I think is important and signals you know that people are trying to quit. This is again among non-abstainers. We do see a significant increase in quit attempts. So 24-hour quit attempts, you know, where people say or uh, report uh, purposely trying not uh, to smoke for 24 hours and not taking a puff for the 24 hours. Uh, no differences between groups again, um, but uh, we're really seeing a high number of, of quit attempts uh, relative to their baseline. Again, so signaling we're moving in the right direction. So conclusions and next steps for us, you know, I think like previous studies comparing E6 to NRT, both were effective. They increased smoking abstinence, uh, reduced cigarettes per day, smoke per day, and reduced cigarette dependence. Um, and there were really no significant differences found between e-cigarettes and NRT. If you really push me, I would say, yeah, if you, I had to pick one, e-cigs might have a slight edge, but not statistically. Um, and uh, e-cigs and NRT had a similar side effect profile, um, which I think is important to know, especially for states and quit lines. Um, and importantly, you know, these effects were seen in the context of re-engagement with a state tobacco quit line um, after an unsuccessful quit line quit attempt. So, um, you know, I think this suggests that e-cigarettes could be a potential help to smokers on quit lines offering them something different um, than uh, maybe what they're currently giving. It obviously doesn't show that e-cigarettes hurt. Um, uh, so I think that's important. Um, also, I want to make note of flavors. Um, since this was one of the key reasons why uh, uh, folks stopped using e-cigarettes was because of flavors, um, it, did serve as an impetus for another grant that I um, have now with um, Tracy Smith, where MPI is on, where we're doing a nationwide studies, a nationwide study of 1,500 smokers, uh, trying to see if uh, flavors matter um, when uh, when uh, smokers uh, uh, are trying to uh, reduce their smoking. Um, so again, I think. The study led to, gave us some final or some close to final decisions, um, but also uh, opened up a, a few more questions, as I guess most studies do. Um, so I, again, I thank you all for your time and um, happy to answer any additional questions folks might have. Okay, thank you. Um, let's turn it over to our discussant, John, to see if he has any questions or comments. Yeah, thanks for that uh, explanation. That was really interesting. Um, one question, I think there was a slide um, that showed a graph on people still using the product, maybe at week 12. Um, among the people who said no to this question, um, they're not still using the product. Do you know whether they had stopped because it's they stopped smoking or uh, maybe they gave up on quitting and they're back to smoking full time? Do you know what that breakdown looked like? Yeah, it was it was it was people that had not quit and um, had but had stopped using the safe product. So they they all had continued smoking. OK, thanks. Um, in the beginning, you had shown a couple results of like the existing literature and, and how effective e-cigarettes were versus some nicotine replacement therapies. Um, but it sounded like those were among maybe people trying to quit for the first time that that had failed to quit recently. 
Um, so how can we think about the results of this study that maybe there wasn't a huge gap between those two groups in the context of the existing literature? Yeah, and I do want to make sure because I believe, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe they're on the call, but the Meyer-Smith, which had like Hayden, McRobbie, and like Pierre Hayek and others on, I believe that study um, was among uh, people not interested in quitting. I um, but uh, why our why our uh, effects weren't as great as theirs? Is that is that the kind of the question that you're? Well, just uh, how do we think about the effects that we yeah. see here versus some? I think it's people? yeah, it's it's definitely. Um, smaller the effects are smaller than what they had especially too when you look at their you know three month time point versus our three month time point for sure um because th their results were you know when we're looking at like the bolner walker and alley study or you know pierre hayek's study that was either six or six months or in peter's case you know one year out um so this is at three months um I think part of it is the population. I also wonder um, what if if potentially, but this again, this is just me wondering if all the stuff going on in the media at the time about Jewel um, affected affected you know the results because there were questions that were frequently coming to the uh, um, uh, coaches about the safety of the product. Um, you know, occasionally, oh, I hear this is worse than cigarettes. Should I really be using it? Um, uh, and then obviously when FDA, uh, you know, comes out at one point during, you know, our last six months of the study and um, uh, says, you know, that uh, they are gonna uh, authorize a marketing denial order for Juul and then it gets, anyways, all of those things obviously add up um, and so maybe it blunted our results. But um, the other thing, though, I would I would point to as well is, you know, I'm I'm also um, I also wonder because we do other studies with Jewel where we look at emissions of nicotine and PK and things like that. And I wonder if uh, products like, you know, because in in the in the Hayek study in the Walker study, they're typically using uh, variable wattage or higher wattage devices. Um, and sometimes I do wonder, especially when you send people to vape shops or someplace to uh, go and uh, walk you through that. I do wonder if that gives uh, participants a better opportunity to learn how to use the product in a way to. Uh, uh get more nicotine more satisfaction from it obviously get different flavors you know we only had two flavors here so i do think there were certain things by the state design that we kind of potentially attenuated uh the results uh, that maybe we weren't going to achieve what the other studies had because we were we were limiting it to one e-cigarette and two flavors if that makes sense. I think the NRT performed how NRT tends to perform. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Mike, I'll pass it over to you for some of the Q&A questions. Okay, thank you. Um, we have, uh, thanks audience for um, uh, amazing participation today. We still have 17 open Q&A questions. So we probably won't be able to get through all 17 in six minutes, but um, but we will do what we, uh, what we can um, for uh, uh, some of the, um, yeah, some of the questions. How do, do rates of nicotine abstinence and dual use compare between the Juul and NRT groups? That's a really good question. I'm not 100% sure. I don't uh, have that here. So I don't want to, I don't want to spout anything off that's incorrect. But um, that is something that I can probably get within an hour here after uh, the call. Okay, great. And you you will receive the full, um, all the Q&A, anything in the Q&A, so you will be able to follow up with uh, individuals um, after, um, if, if you would like. Um, what about addressing the oral fixation? That is one of the behaviors that is addressed with combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes. You aren't addressing this behavior in using e-cigarettes. You are or aren't? You 
aren't addressing this behavior and using e-cigarettes. I to, to paraphrase, I guess what I think this question is asking is, um, is there any downside to including the e-cigarette because unlike the NRT, the e-cigarette um, uh, isn't helping people to correct the or their oral fixation addiction. Oh, correct it. I hear what you're saying. Um, I don't know. At the end of the day, I'm a harm reductionist. So uh, yeah, I'm trying to get, so this is just me from my standpoint. I think at the end of the day, if, uh, you know, if people are going to smoke and they've tried with NRT in the past and have been successful, I want them to use something that's of lower harm. Um, and yeah, I get it. If they, you're, you're maintaining the, the oral hand to mouth, uh, fixation. We can even see that in no nicotine placebo, you know, that that's effective in helping people stop smoking. But I think that's the point. I think our goal is to get them to stop smoking. So, um, uh, and also be mindful that most of these people had tried NRT before and were involved in quit line. So they got the best shot from the quit line at first and were still smoking. So it's kind of like we had to go to another level for, for some of these folks. Okay. Uh, were you able to do a subgroup analysis by age? Older adults, 65 plus, are the least likely to use E6 according to national level data, but are also the only age group that hasn't seen a change in smoking prevalence in the U.S. in about 20 years. Second question, did participants have co-occurring addictions or substance use, alcohol, cannabis, opioids? Uh, your first question is, no, we haven't, but we could. And that's a really good question. Um, the second co-occurring um, we do have a measure. I do not have that data, though, on hand. Okay. Um, uh, given that people who are given Juul remain addicted to nicotine with its adverse effects, why not conclude that using FDA-approved NRT, where the endpoint is nicotine abstinence, why not conclude that there is no benefit of riskier Juul over NRT? Say that again? Maybe. Um, uh, I guess, I guess uh, let's just go to the end of the question here. Why not conclude from your study that there is no benefit of risk your jewel over NRT? Oh, that there's no benefit of jewel over NRT. Yeah, I do think that is, uh, you know, one conclusion that could be made. I, um, and I would, I would be fine with that. I think though it might miss something bigger here, which is that, we have another nicotine delivery device, which is exactly what NRT is, um, that may be helpful um, as well. Um, uh, now, I think the ultimate question is, well, what's the safety profile? And, you know, I point to uh, one, the data that we collect at adverse events, but now we're looking at long-term harm and we don't know the long-term harm. We can look at proxies though, and we can look at biomarkers and you know changes in lung functioning and things like that. In the lung functioning, there's some inflammation, so that's concerning. But then there's stuff, there's research that has looked at, you know, um, smokers versus non-smokers versus exclusive e-cigarette users, where we've looked at, you know, Bronx studies and the lungs of of exclusive e-cigarette users look more like non-smokers than they look like smokers. Um, so I guess I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think a multimodal approach is what we need. I I wouldn't want to if if I have a tool that you know it, it works for some people, um, but maybe it's just a little dirtier. I I still want to have that tool in case the super clean FDA approved tool um, uh, uh, doesn't work. Also, want to point to like Mache Ganowitz's article back out. You know, let's say three years ago using path data, looking at biomarkers, you know, showing that e-cigarette exclusive users look a whole heck of a lot like NRT users when you look at a bunch of biomarkers. Um, so again, I I, uh, I think there is data out there that suggests that um, not only can e-cigarettes be helpful, but maybe even helpful for, you know, people who, who fail on FDA approved products. And I wouldn't want to just get rid of a potential tool that could be helpful for a lot of people. But yes, 100%, this showed that they were just as good. 
Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and and there were a lot of uh, remaining uh, uh, questions. Um, so perhaps after uh, tops, you'll have an opportunity to reach out to some people. But um, I'm going to send it over to our MC to take us out the door. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 200 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend.